talk to you about fully abstract compilation, what it is, why you would want it, and how to prove a compiler has this property. Now, full abstraction is a very strong property for a compiler to satisfy. So let's contrast it to something you're probably more familiar with, correct compilation, uh, the kind of theorem proven about the CompCert compiler. So I'll call this pro property whole program compiler correctness. And we start with a whole source program P. And in this talk, uh, source programs will be blue. Uh, then we compile it to our target language. And I represent target code as red and compilation by these brackets. Then whole program compiler correctness says uh, P and its compilation, in some sense, have the same behavior. So they produce the same effects, or they're in bi-simulation. Um, and to be more concrete, maybe I want this Hello World program. I want to verify that the compilation of this thing will actually put a representation on Hello World somewhere so that Hello World actually gets displayed on the screen. And it's a nice story, uh, but there's a big problem. And the problem is there's no such thing as a whole program. Even a program as simple as Hello World is actually linking with a runtime system or some kind of device drivers. And we also write libraries in one high-level language and then link with code written in other languages and link them together at the assembly code level. But how do programmers reason about these mixed language programs? Uh, by linking with code in other languages, we've now extended the language that programmers have to reason about. So if the interface with these other languages is not well designed, then I lose the high-level reasoning principles that my source language was designed to facilitate. So now, instead of our nice, beautiful, high-level source language, the programmer also has to understand how their program is compiled and how assembly code can interact with them. So if I have to reason at the assembly code level, what's the point of my beautiful source language anyway? So uh, full abstract compilation takes the, the view that source programmers should be able to use all these nice source language reasoning principles. And so a fully abstract compiler guarantees that when programmers reason about only linking with source code, their reasoning still holds when linking with target code. And so the way we're going to formally capture this idea of source language reasoning is through a formal property called contextual equivalence. And so this judgment reads, E1 is contextually equivalent in the source language, and I'm representing that with this S on the equivalence. So E1 is contextually equivalent to E2 at a type tau when E1 is indistinguishable from E2 by program context of type tau. And so this is a key formal principle for us to think about because it captures uh, the kinds of refactorings that programmers do all the time. Anytime I'm replacing a program, uh, one program fragment with another, and I know that the whole program uh, can't change. Um, and so specifically, it captures ideas like data abstraction. So if I change the underlying representation of my abstract data type, uh, then I know it won't break client code. Or um, reasoning about security. So if an object has a private field with a secret in it that's never exposed, then it should be indistinguishable from another object uh, that has a different secret. And then fully abstract compilation uh, guarantees that all these reasoning principles are preserved by compilation. So given two source programs that are indistinguishable uh, at a type tau, then there's a target language type uh, tau div uh, which is the representation of the source interface in the target language so that the compiled programs are indistinguishable by target language context at this type tau div. And so thinking about those reasoning principles again, it says that I can change the representation of my abstract data type and I won't break client code written in the target language. And target language attackers can't distinguish private fields that I don't expose to them. Uh, so to understand that better, let's look at why most compilers fail to be fully abstract. And so full abstraction fails when the target interface is too liberal. It opens up new ways to interact with uh, our, source prog our compiled programs that weren't available in the source language. And so as a simple example, uh, let's look at how control flow in the target language breaks full abstraction, uh, and specifically I'll use exceptions. So let's take as a source language a functional language with uh, general recursion. And as the target language, the same language, but with the ability to raise Boolean valued exceptions. And so I'll show that this source language compiling to this target language, uh, just embedding, is uh, not fully abstract. So here's two programs in our source language. Uh, the they both take a function that accepts Booleans. The first calls it on true and then false and returns unit. And then the second calls it on false and then true and returns unit. So they call the function on all possible inputs, but in a different order. 
So these functions are actually equivalent in our source language. And the reason is the source language, the only effect is non-termination. So if f diverges on uh, both true, uh, either true or false, then both programs diverge. And if uh, it terminates on both, then they'll both terminate with unit value. But we can easily distinguish between these in the target language using uh, the exceptions. And this is because the exceptions give us this kind of information side channel not present in our source language. So if a context is allowed to raise exceptions, it'll just, it can just raise the first uh, value that it's called on. And then this first program will get a true valued exception, and then the second one will get a false valued exception. So these programs that were indistinguishable in the source language uh, can be told apart in the target. And uh, to be perfectly clear, uh, unless you're specifically doing uh, this full abstraction research, your compiler that you wrote is not going to be fully abstract. Uh, and, there, and there's all kinds of reasons, just basically uh, low intentional uh, properties of your programs are exposed to the target level. So uh, control flow that's not present in the source language will break it. I use exceptions. Uh, assembly code, you, you know, you can jump into the middle of a program. Uh, pointer equality will break extensional equality of functions. And then unless you're hiding your private memory specifically, uh, you'll be able to tell them apart. And I, I recommend this paper, uh, Securing the .NET Programming Model by Andrew Kennedy. There's a lot of these examples and talks about how failures of full abstraction can result in uh, security violations. Um, so that's the bad news. Uh, so where do we go from there? How do we actually make one of these fully abstract compilers? Well, the first way, uh, which always works, is to just add the target features to the source language. Uh, but this one's a, a no-go for us because we actually like these security and modularity pro, uh, features of our source language. Uh, the second way is to dynamically enforce uh, this interface. So in the target language, we monitor a target context as it interacts with the source. And you raise some kind of error uh, if it tries to uh, interact with the, source, uh, the compiled program in a way not available in the source language. So for example, you might dynamically enforce memory isolation um, using special hardware. And uh, for our exceptions example, you could uh, catch the exceptions raised by the target code. Uh, and the, this uh, allows you to link with arbitrary target code, but at a potentially serious uh, performance cost. And so the third way, which is what we use in our paper, uh, is to use some kind of static verification in the target language uh, to rule out bad behaving code in the first place. And so uh, we use, for example, a, a type system for the target language. And then we still have to prove that the static interface we designed for the target language is correctly implementing the source interface. And so the downside here is you have to verify these programs, uh, but you avoid the uh, performance cost of dynamic checks. And if you're linking with code written in another high-level language, then this proof could be automatically produced by, uh, by another compiler. And so that brings us to the contributions of our paper. Uh, so we proved a, a closure conversion pass fully abstract, uh, where the source and target have uh, recursive types, and the target has polymorphism and exceptions. And then the, the source is simply typed. And we use static types in the target to, to ensure this uh, full abstraction. And more important than the actual details, uh, the specific details of this uh, source and target language is the, uh, the way we proved it, which I call uh, universal embedding. And so in order to understand that, let's first look at how you prove full abstraction and why it's so hard to prove full abstraction. So, um, so to prove full abstraction, we're given equivalent source programs, and we want to show that their, target pro that their compilations are indistinguishable. Um, so we're given a well-typed target, uh, C, and then we want to show that the compiled programs are, have, uh, linking with C have the same behavior. So for example, they both diverge, or they both terminate with equal values. Uh, but all we know is up here, that E1 and E2 are indistinguishable to source contexts. And so in order to use this fact, we need to somehow come up with source contexts uh, to interact with E1 and E2 so that we can use this equivalence. And uh, that's how the proof works, it's and we construct what we call a back translation. So what we do is we take our uh, context C and we back translate it to a blue context, uh, source context, which I call the back translation of C, and I represent using this back translation arrow. And then we have to prove that the target, um, that the compiled program interacting with the target context has the same behavior as the source program interacting with the, uh, with the back translated context. And then we can show that the compiled programs interacting with the target context have the same behavior. First, because they have the same behavior as the source programs interacting with the back translated context. 
And then uh, the source programs interacting with the back translated context uh, have the same behavior because they're contextually equivalent. So they have the same behavior interacting with any uh, source context. So the key to this full abstraction proof is this back translation, which simulates the behavior of a target language context in the source language. And so this is why full abstraction is uh, so hard to prove, uh, because if we're thinking about compiling high-level languages like ML and Haskell to uh, disgusting low-level languages like assembly code, then this means simulating the low-level interactions and behaviors of the assembly code in our high-level language. And so uh, we're not here yet. Uh, and full of prior work has kind of been in, in two parts. There's been low-level work that's compiled low-level languages to assembly code, uh, use things like uh, hardware to enforce memory isolation. And on the other side, you have uh, high-level languages compiling to these functional intermediate languages. Uh, but there's kind of a gap here in, in the kind of control flow that these languages have. And so um, focusing on the, the top half, uh, some, some work has, uh, had, has been limited to back translation where uh, the source and the target language are syntactically identical. And so um, this is the case for a lot of intermediate compiler uh, transformations, but it doesn't face all the, all the interesting cases. Um, another line of work has had a bigger difference between the source and target language and what features are present, but has critically relied on termination uh, in the target language. And so uh, this works by basically to back translate, you take the context, you normalize it, so you get rid of all the target language features, uh, and then you back translate this normalized one that's uh, easier to do. Uh, and so this one's not very realistic uh, if we want to compile to, like, if we want to compile real languages. Um, so uh, in this work, we're still on this top half, uh, but we're going to have a bigger gap between our source and target, uh, and we're going to have this gap of uh, control flow issues, and uh, we're not going to rely on um, termination of either language. So uh, back to what we did. We prove this closure conversion pass where we have source and target are re recursive types, so they're non-terminating, and the target has polymorphism and exceptions. So the exceptions are mismatch in the control flow, uh, so we have to accommodate that somehow to, in order to make our compiler fully abstract. And uh, the polymorphism is maybe a, a stranger looking choice, uh, so we include it because uh, it's a natural addition to the type system when you're doing a typed closure conversion pass. Uh, and while there's no reason, a priori, why it should break full abstraction, uh, it does make this back translation more difficult because we have, to, we have to back translate this feature that doesn't exist in the source language. So uh, in the interest of clarity, I'm not going to talk about closure conversion details too much, and I'll just focus on these two uh, features. So how do we actually go about making our compiler fully abstract? Well. Like I said, we're going to use static types in our target language uh, in order to ensure it. So uh, we're going to write a type-preserving compiler. And then the key to full abstraction is, is in the design of this type translation. So we need to make sure that this target language type is precise enough that it rules out behaviors uh, that don't make sense in the source language. Uh, and so as I showed earlier, that means that we can't have any uncaught exceptions flowing from the target language code uh, to the compiled source programs. And so the way we're going to guarantee this is using a type and effect system in our target language. And so here, uh, E is a type constructor for a possibly exception-raising computation. Um, the first type is the uh, type of possible exceptions that could be raised. And so in our type translation, we use an empty uh, exception type um, so that code can't allow exceptions to escape. And uh, the second type is the type of possible values, successful values that will be returned. And uh, this one I'll call sigma plus, but um, it's just like follows the structure of the connectives and uh, it's not as interesting. So I, I won't talk about that in detail. Uh, and then uh, recalling our example from before, uh, these equivalent source programs are given uh, a type in the target language that says that they, they will only link with things that uh, satisfy this void exception type. And then uh, our bad context is ruled out because it has to be given a type that reflects that it uh, raises uh, Boolean exceptions. So, um, so that was good. We did a good job designing our type translation. So it seems plausible that we are fully abstract. But now we need to actually construct this back translation in order to prove it. And so this is our technique, which I call universal embedding. So 
so the problem is at the boundary with our source code, uh, these programs act like source programs. So they don't raise exceptions into the compiled programs. They use the right uh, values. Um, but internally, in order to implement that interface, uh, they might use features that the source language doesn't have. So they raise exceptions only to catch them, uh, or they construct and instantiate polymorphic code. And so how do we implement these behaviors in our source language in order to prove full abstraction? Uh, so first, with the exceptions, we can just use the sums of the source language in order to encode them. So uh, raise uh, is an in left, uh, return, a successful value is an in right, uh, and then we can use uh, case analysis to implement uh, uh, catch. And then uh, if our target language didn't have exceptions, then actually this would be enough. We'd just be able to write this well-typed embedding of our target language in our source language. So let's look at polymorphism. So what's the problem here? And then, so the problem is there's no type in our source language that precisely captures the polymorphic function type of the target language. Um, but the thing is that the the polymorphic type isn't actually at the boundary between the source programs and the, compile and the target language. So we don't need to precisely capture this interface. So instead, what we'll do is we'll use an imprecise type uh, in order to simulate the behaviors of polymorphic code. And so we'll use a bigger type than a polymorphic type, something that has more possible behaviors, but at least can capture all of the ones of this polymorphic function type. And so specifically, we're going to use a dynamic typing in our source language. And so that's what I call our technique, which I call a universal embedding. So uh, we make an untyped embedding of the target language in our source for our back translation. And then we have to mediate between the strongly typed source representation and the untyped back translation representation. And so when we had this idea, we looked into the literature, and we found that it was uh, basically the exact same technique that was being used in the 2000s on a couple of uh, independent works that I'll just refer to collectively as embedded interpreters, um, where they use this as a practical implementation technique uh, to implement a, an embedded scripting language inside a typed uh, functional language, uh, ML. And so, um, and then, and then so that the host language and the embedded language could exchange values freely. Uh, and so we were able to take inspiration from this and it's funny because this is a practical implementation technique and ours is just a proof technique. Um, and so um, uh, more details on this universal embedding. So our, our, the computations of our target language will be given this universal result type R. And then the values of the target language will be encoded using this universal type U. And so, um, so a, a universal result will be either a dynamically typed exception or a dynamically typed successful value. And then the universal value type will satisfy all the connectives, uh, will support all the connectives of the target language, including uh, sums and products and, and functions that can themselves uh, raise exceptions. And then we can back translate the um, polymorphic functions by using this dynamic function type. And though there's a lot more dynamic typed uh, functions than polymorphic functions, um, but it doesn't matter because all we need is to be able to simulate the behavior of the polymorphic functions. And so we're almost there now. We've taken the context and back translated it to this uh, result type. And while it behaves like the target context when interacting with suitable terms of result type, what we need is for it to interact with our sor original source program at this, uh, at this strong source type. And so we need to be able to mediate between these two uh, representations. So first, we need to be able to turn our uh, strongly typed representation into this dynamic representation, which we call embed. And then since we're higher order, we also need to have dynamic values projected back onto the precise representation of our source language, which we call project. And this one is, in general, partial because uh, I, mean, I might be trying to project a Boolean value down onto a, a function. Uh, and so this uh, pattern of embedding projection pairs that comes all over the place uh, goes all the way back to uh, 70s with Dana Scott uh, with um, universal domains. Um, and, now, and these days, more in the uh, gradual typing research where you have uh, a dynamic type in your source language. And as I mentioned, the em embedded interpreters were. Uh, and so the key property that they satisfy is that they form a retraction pair. So if I have something uh, at this strong source type, I translate it to a dynamic type and then back, then I get back, I get something equivalent to what I started. And so uh, that's the final piece of this puzzle. 
Uh, so we back translate to this uh, untyped uh, representation, and then we mediate uh, between the strongly typed source representation and the dynamically typed representation. Uh, and then to complete the proof, we have to show that the compiled program in interacting with the target context has the same behavior as the source program interacting with the back translated context mediated by this embedding. And so uh, this is just a high level overview. Obviously, we have to use some, we use some pretty strong proof tools. So uh, first, we use a multi language semantics to define a sort of idealized interaction between the source and target language. And then we use logical relations to actually prove all these contextual equivalence results uh, and our back translation correctness theorem. And then uh, the way our proof works is we show that our embedded interpreter, the universal embedding, is uh, in a suitable sense equivalent to the multi-language semantics. And there's a lot more details inside. Obviously, uh, I didn't talk about the closure conversion stuff. And we also proved this compositional compiler correctness theorem in addition to full abstraction. And so check out our very detailed online tech report with uh, all the logical relations you could ever want. Uh, and so um, just to look to the future a little, um, and so the thing to realize here is that um, we don't have a completely systematic way of constructing these back translations. So we have, the, we have techniques like universal embedding, but the back translations themselves uh, depend on the source and target uh, combination of features. So for example, if you kept our source language the same and you had different effects in the target language, uh, you could use similar techniques. So we, used, uh, we had exception as long as the effect is bracketed in an appropriate way. So we use exceptions, which we did with the sum type. Uh, you could simulate state using a store passing style. And, if you, uh, and that's bracketed state, so something like Haskell's ST monad. Um, and then if you had some kind of bracketed continuations, you could maybe do a continuation passing style. Uh, and as I said, we were doing kind of high level uh, uh, intermediate language, but we want to do this for low level code. And so the idea would be to do uh, an embedded interpreter for assembly. So s simulate the um, the assembly code and the heap and the, uh, the pointers that they use, and then mm, somehow mediate between the representations. That's, that's future work. Uh, and one challenge that we have is uh, when the source language becomes more complex. And the reason is that uh, we have to construct this universal type. And while a universal type for assembly type language is pretty well understood, I'm Dana Scott figured it all out, uh, we still have to figure out how to do these for, say, polymorphic source language or dependently typed source language or or even just a stateful source language. Uh, and so we hope to look for to grow domain theory research and gradual typing for inspiration here. Uh, and if you know all the answers to that, please tell me. Uh, and so uh, just to wrap up, uh, some takeaways from this talk. Um, first, full abstraction ensures the compiler preserves security and modularity of source programs. Uh, and it's very hard. Uh, next, proving full abstraction means simulating target behaviors in the source language. And finally, Simulating type features of one type language and another uh, might necessitate uh, imprecise typing to do it. Um, so thank you. Uh, hi, we have time for one or two quick questions. And uh, please state your name and affiliation before asking the question. Um, so Phil. Phil Wadler, University of Edinburgh. So thank you. That was a very clear talk. But um, so there are two things you were doing, right? Adding exceptions. I understand yeah. you map those by into some types. And then adding polymorphism. But of course, the notion that you'd go from a simply typed language to a polymorphic language oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. is pretty insane. Um, but you've titled your technique, universal embedding, after that bit. Yeah. Right? You, you see, so, so OK. So the. Um, so the question is, why, why would you have polymorphism target well, not well, to target? Well, my summary of your so, paper is we've shown it's right, 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 to do right. something you'd never want to do. Well, no. So what I'm saying is, in order to uh, ensure these full abstraction properties, you need very strong properties of the target language. So, um, uh, so we needed a polymorphism for, um, for the closure conversion pass. And the idea is, like, in order to have a static property that you can have in the target language in order to capture these, you need more complicated reasoning uh, than your source language types because you're making more restrictions on, uh, on target language code. And uh, another reason would be that if, you're, if you have two different source languages, and one of them was simply typed and another was polymorphic, and you're compiling so that they could interact with each other, you would have to have polymorphism in order to show that the polymorphic one was fully abstract. Uh, 
and, and so that it could interoperate with the simply typed one. Could your techniques also be used to show that compiling into a dynamically typed language was fully abstract? Yes. That might be useful. <laughs> Hi, uh, Derek Dreyer. Um, a question about, so what, what exactly you mean by full abstraction here? So in most of the talk, I thought you were saying that um, two terms are equivalent in the source language, then, uh, then their translations are equivalent in the target language. Yeah. Um, but then at the end, you brought up the multi-language semantics. So um, there, it seemed like you're saying uh, that that, <laughs> okay. that if two terms are equivalent in the uh, in this multi-language semantics, right? Two source terms are equivalent in the multi-language semantics. Then their translations are equivalent in the multi-language semantics. Uh, no, I, I do mean the source language versus the target language. And then uh, what will happen is if your compiler is uh, correct then equivalence in the multi-language will be the same as equivalence of the compiled, co uh, contextual equivalence in the compiled language. Okay, talk offline. Yeah. Okay, so let's all uh, thank Max again.